All right, so first thing we're going to talk about is, again, how to make our file. So I'll do my image editor. You can open MinGW with the editor and open your previous file, create a new project, create a new file, anything you like. I'll just use uh, the file editor Vim, and then I'll compile it with the command line. So Vim, and this will be like 2.c. Now I'll include stdio again for printing out its main Hello. zero close this and let's say GCC this will be a lec look here okay, GCC lec 2.c link it I'll put it to lec 2.0 and then run lec 2.0 just to make sure this is working I misspelled that now it works dandy right so now we can go into the next step the first thing I'll talk about is calculations so we talked about the general plus minus multiply divide uh, there's a easy way if you wanted to say int a and you wanted to just add one to a then you can just do a plus plus and this will let's say is 10 then we do the a plus plus and I want to just print this out so percent D and a when I run this I'll get 11 because the say plus plus just adds one to it right the minus minus does what you might expect it'll subtract one from it so so the methods here are plus plus to add one minus minus to subtract one then there are two other messes plus equal to add some amount. So the way this works is a plus equal three will add three to a. So that's equivalent to a equals a plus three. And of course, a minus equal is a minus three. So minus equal to subtract some amount so those are the additional ways of calculating so with c we just talked a little more about calculations just how to add one subtract one very quickly from a variable next thing is functions which we've dealt with already right our int main is a function we'll just be building more into those talking about how to make more complex functions and using them Next, we'll go into conditions. This is things that uh, they're, they're an if statement, for example, you want to check if something is the case, like if something equals something, then do this. If it equals something else, do something else, uh, so on. So you can make different things happen based on different checks that you're doing. And then we'll have loops and loops work similar to the conditions basically but it just repeats some operation so long as a condition is true so that's what we'll be going over today um, so kind of as a summary of each of those we've got functions so with a function we have some inputs then we have some box and outputs and everything that happens in this box is sort of exclusively cared about internal to the function. So like if we create a variable in a function, it's like how we talked about blocks before. It's similar because it really is remained only being defined in that function. So, well, let's go over the structure of this. So. Here you have your data type. 
So this is what the output of your function, uh, what the data type of the output is going to be. Then you have function name. I'll just say a name for now. Then you have the data type and input one. And add if you have more inputs, you have the data type for the second input, and then what you want the name for the second input to be, and so on. And then you open the block just like we do with our int main. And then you close the block. And in here you can make variables. It's you can do whatever you can do in the rest of the C program. Uh, it'll just be if you say a is 11 right here, the rest of the program won't see the a is 11. It will just see at the end how in the int main we return an integer, we return zero. Here we'll return a variable matching this data type. Let's say we call it output. Then we just return this output and that's the only thing. Now when I call up this, uh, I'll have to, if in my int main, I want to use this function, int main. And let's say this data type is int. This is also int. The name is name. Of course, I have to define these int a int plus input, let's say, then this will just add 11 to whatever the input is. And that's what it will return. So to use this, I'll match the data type of the output. So int, I'll just call my variable var, this equals name, because that's the name of my function. And then I have one input, that's an integer. I'll just say one for now. Now var will equal 12 because it will add 11 to one and I'll just get 12. And if I try to call up this, this will give an error because in this scope, a is not defined, right? I could print out A in this function, but outside this function, it's not defined. So let's go into C and actually use this and do some example functions. So here I've got my basic outline. Okay, so I can say Let's say we want to create a function that just prints out running function whenever it runs the function, whenever we call it up. So the way I'll do this is I'll go outside of my int main. I'll just define a function up here. And if I don't want an output, then I can just say void. This just means it will return nothing. Uh, so you don't need to actually do a return in this function. So void, and I'll call it print one. That'll be my function name. It'll have no inputs. And inside, all I'm going to do is I'm going to print f and running. Okay. Now to actually use this, I'll go in here and I'll just say print one. And will this work? You might wonder, well, let's run it. And it does indeed work because it doesn't, since it is a void, it doesn't actually return anything. So we don't need to do like an int a equals print. Uh, it it doesn't have an, uh, something returned from the function. So we can just call it up with no inputs. It will do it. We could call it up again. Of course, it'll just print it out twice now. So that's a basic function. We can create another one. And this will just add two double variables together. So let's say we want to output a double. And we want it to add two doubles together. 
So I'll just call it sum D and it'll have two inputs, double A and double B. And these inputs are just names that I choose for this function, right? These, it, it doesn't matter what is fed into this. It's just saying, right as I start this function, it says, okay, A equals whatever my first input is. So let's say I did sum D of one, one. Then I immediately, when I call up this function, I'll just say A equals one and B equals one. So it just gives me a name to reference internal to the function for these variables, A and B. So it doesn't matter outside of the function what, what this is called. So I want it to return A plus B, but all, in this case, say double C is A plus B, and return this C. Now, I could make a function, let's say, to just print out a double. What I can do in this case is print D, and I give it a double, and it doesn't matter that these two match, right? Because these are only used in this, its own function. So this will never see the A in the other function. So we can just do printf and percent D new line and A. So that just lets me do in one step, print D up, and I'll make double calc sum will be my variable name and we'll do sum d of let's say 10 and and i'll make a floating point then when i print d calc sum we walk through oops, we walk through what this program is going to do so this is my int main first i do print one so i then go right here it takes in no input, so I'm good there. And then it prints running function new line. And it doesn't have any output, so it just does running function enter. Back of this right here. So it'll only right now have done running function. Then we go to the double calc sum equals sum d of 10 point and 30 point. So I go to my sum D, the data types match, perfect. And then my calculate calc sum will be the what the return goes to. So whatever I get when I run this function, that'll be calc sum. And I do equal sum D of 10 and 30. So A is 10, B is 30. When I go in here and it just says double C is 10 plus 30. So double C will equal 40. Then I return the 40. So double, this line just says calc sum equals 40. And then I print D of calc sum and my print D is a void. So it doesn't have any outputs, perfect. And print D double A, so it takes a double. That is a double, perfect. And then it prints out percent D slash N with the A in for the integer there. So I want this to be an E, right? To print out this dot. So then it will just print out 40.000000E00 or something like that. It'll, it'll be the scientific notation of 40, right? There we go. So if I say this, run it, that's a decoration of function. Of course, I named this wrong. The 40 will be 4E1, right? So 4.123456E plus 0, 01. But that's what it, uh, 
what it does in this case, right? And that's exactly what I wanted. So perfect. That's how we can create some functions. If you wanted to make a function that creates or that adds two floats together, you'd say float some F uh, or name it whatever you want, but just something that will make sense is best. Uh, then you do float A, float B, float C equals A plus B, and then return C, and that'll do the same thing with a float. Or you could do it with an integer, anything like that. All right, there we are. So I'll do one more example just using different names here. So it's less confusing. Or so hopefully makes sense that you can use whatever names you want. It doesn't matter. So I'll create a sum function for integers and I'll just call it about a little right doesn't matter um, I can name it whatever I like and then I have int var one int second input keep it like that if I want and here I can do int something I want to name it this equals var one plus second input and then I return something I want to name it. Now I can try printf percent d and new line a b a w y t a w e r a e f and n three run this. I can indeed because the output of this will be a integer. So it's as if I just type the integer in here and then it substitutes it in for the percent D. So it works just fine. If I tried to do this, would it work? It still will because it'll just convert these two integers, even though I fed it in as a floating point. It'll just say int var one and it'll take that one point as a integer. But if I did double a equals one, then when I feed this in a, it'll again be just fine because it will just convert it to an integer. So you have to be very careful. Again, of course, when you're dealing with the different data types, because it may interpret the data type and convert it to another one. Uh, as you may have noticed from this, it made it somewhat unnecessarily complicated because I had to remember exactly what, this isn't a word, this isn't anything that I can easily remember. So of course, when you make a real function, you want to pick some name that's useful here, that's easy to type. Um, I just made it this so that you can see it. Uh, you have the freedom to call it whatever you want. You just want to pick something that makes sense. But then you can do infar one, whatever you want to call this. This is just the variable that you use here. So these just need to match, but they can be whatever you like. And then second input, once again, they just need to match. And then something I want to name it is unnecessarily long, but it works just fine um, in the actual program aspect of it. And then I can return that and use it perfectly well down here in this function. If I defined this function down below, will this work? Because I define the int main before I define the function that's calling and write this, run this, we get the warning implicit declaration of the function. Uh, the reason for this, and you'll see it does this really odd computation here. This should be just four, remember, but it's giving us a really weird thing. Uh, and that's because we defined it after our main. So we have two options. We can either move this up above like it was before, or we can initialize it. Uh, so I'll do int a b a w y t a w e r a e f in for one in second in and i can just 
initialize it without saying exactly what it does. And when I save this, uh, it'll have it declared. And then it will, since it's defined later, it will just basically update this with what it actually is computing here. So that should clear up the warning and this weird output we're getting because it's not calculating correctly. So now that I've saved it, if I run it again, you can see it does exactly that. It saves it as a four properly. But realistically, you're just going to want to actually have defined it up here. There's no reason to define it down there instead. There we go. That's creating functions. Let me clean this up actually real quick, make it more clear. Okay, now we've got it cleaned up a little bit so it's easier to see. While we've got more code, having it tabbed in like this makes it much more readable. Okay, so that was functions. Now let's get into conditions. So the way conditions work is you basically have true and false. So how we have numerical values that we can have variables equal, like one for an integer, 15 for a double, things like that. We can have true and false, which are Booleans. And to use a Boolean, or to specifically create a variable that's a Boolean, we can do stdbool.h, include that header. Now, if I do bool h is true, now it will construct that just fine. And I can, normally I don't just want things to be true or false, that won't be super helpful, um, but I wanna check Let's say I've got a variable, int a is 1, and this variable I've changed a bunch of times, so now I want to, so I've got some code there, now I want to check what a is equal to and do something based on that. Then what I can do is I can say check what a is equal to, I can say a equals equals one. For example, this is using a check. And I've got a couple of different options with that. I've got equal equal. This means is it equal to does it match the value of I've got less than checks if it's less than greater than checks if it's greater than less than or equal to greater than or equal to and not equal. So I can use this, but I don't want to just do this. I could either say bool var equals this and close it off to actually make it see code. So I could run this, for example, and it wouldn't give me any trouble. And var would be true right now. And now if I wanted to do something as a result of that, I can do an if statement. And the way I can do an if statement is go back out my notes. So I'm on conditions. With conditions, we have an if statement. With if, we have if, then we have our condition. This is like the a equals equals one or whatever check we've got. Then we have the curly brace to open the block, close the curly brace down there. And then we have whatever we want to do in here. So the idea is that you're running some code, you get to this point, you check the condition. If this is true, then you run whatever's in here. There's also, a couple things that can come with it. There's else, if, and else. So, if 
if only requires if to be here. You don't have to include else if or else. They're just optional. Um, you can include n number of, of else ifs. You can only have one else. And the reason for that is uh, if condition, you say a equals equals one, this just go goes in here and runs whatever. Uh, with an else if, you stick it at the end of your if, and then you give it another condition. So this is condition two. This could be a equals equal two, for example. Then you have another block here. And in here, you write whatever code you want to run only if this is not true, but this is. So it goes into this if. If this is true, it's done. It skips any else ifs. But if this is not true, then it goes to this else. And then it goes into this if checks. OK, is the condition too true? If so, it runs. If not, it just exits. Uh, so you can have multiple else ifs. You just have different conditions there. Condition three, open curly brace, whatever you want to run, close curly brace. Then I could keep on going, repeat this with however many else ifs I want. And then at the end, when I'm done, if I want, if none of these conditions have been met, so I have checking condition, condition two, condition three, all the other conditions for any else ifs I've got, then at the end here, I can include an else. And else runs only if every condition above was not met. So it will always run if it gets to this point in the if statement. Because it doesn't have a condition, it just runs if nothing else has been run. So you don't need to give it some condition. You just say else, open curly brace, whatever you want it to do. If none of these have happened, and then you close curly brace. So that's how you can structure an if, else, else if condition. So let's look at an example of this. So I can use if to check how A and B compare. So let's say if, and I can just, instead of creating a variable, I could create the variable A equals equals B, but I don't need to. I can just put it in the if statement. So A if A equals equals B instead of A of var. And I could delete this. So then I could say print F A equals B. Do a new line. Close this off. And then I can run just this. It does it just fine. It won't do anything because A does not equal B, of course, if I swapped them to both equal one. Then it'll pop out that A equals B. So let's swap it back. And then we do an else, but I want to check if this is not true, my earlier check, but I want to check against something else. I can do else if, and then A is greater than B. Then I want to print out A greater than B. New line, close that, close that. Indent these for clarity. Now when I run it, it will again not do anything because A is less than B. So else if A is less than B, and F A is less than B, new line, close that. And now I print out A is less than B, of course. Then I could have an else. And I could just say print F unknown. So I can save this. And I still get out that A is less than B. And of course, it just went through. Said it does it equal B. No. If it did, then it would immediately just skip out past here and be done, right? So then I check, else if a is greater than b, it is not the case that, so won't print that out. 
go to this close, then check else if uh, the ones before weren't met, so we continue past this else. We look at the if A is less than B. A is less than B, so we'll run what's in these curly braces, because I could have a bunch of lines. I could say C equals A plus B. I could say A equals B. I could run a bunch of stuff in here, um, whatever I want. And then go to our final else, which only runs if all the checks before the if and else ifs were not met up above, or even just one if or one if and one else if or more. Then we go to our else and run it once all those have been checked. Then we do whatever's in here. So that's how we can use if, else, if, else. That's the structure of that. A shorthand way of doing this is if you want to check just a true false condition and you want to do this versus this. So basically a very simple, if you wanted to just check if A is equal to B or it's not, then you could do this, if A equals equals B, and then print equals B. Then if you wanted, in every other scenario, you wanted to print if A equals not equal B. Then you close this. This is a basic way. If you didn't want to check greater than, less than, or anything else, you just want to check if it's equal or not, then a shorthand way of doing this is you can say, so let's just do a bool in this case, uh, a equal b, it's my variable, and I'll say this equals, and a equals equals b, this is my condition here in my if, and then question mark, and then whatever happens if it's true, so if it's true, I want A equal B to be true. This will be the result of, or this will be the value of A underscore EQ underscore B if A does equal B. And then I have an a colon. And then this is the value if it's false. And I'll just give it false. So when I run this, C is undeclared. Oh, this line here. There we go. A is less than B and A equals B. It's because, of course, in this earlier one, I said A equal to B. So now in this F else, A does equal B. And if I were to check if A EQ B, then... This will be true, of course, because it's my parentheses here. So that's shorthand way of just checking if you want to give a variable some value if true and something else if false, then you can check some condition and update some variable. So. I could find int a eq b equals the check a equals equals b question mark value of true. Say we give this one a zero if it's false. Now when I run this, I get the same thing as before when it was a boolean. If this is a zero, it will not run. And if it's a one, will. And same if it's two, and so on. So it's just if it's a zero, then it won't run. But that's how an if works, how a shorthand works for a conditional check. The next thing is a switch case. Now we'll look at combining booleans or comparisons with operators and an or 
which allow us to do things based upon if multiple conditions are true or if it's just a single one that's true and combining them into a single check. Variables int a is one, int b is two, and int c. How we can check, let's say if a equals b and a equals c, so you can do this is with and, and this will just work to check multiple things, right? So an and will want both of them to be true, and or means either if, if either of them are true, then it will return true, right? So we do print f true, and then else print f. So in this, it's false if a does equal one and c does equal one or or it'll be true so if c equals three but a does equal b it'll be true if i swap to and that run that it's false until they do all equal so with that you can actually like couple conditions together so you could have any set of conditions you want that to be true, or um, A equals D, for example. And this would then check, because of the order operations, it would check if A equals B and A equals C, and then if that whole thing is true, or A equals D, and D is 1, then it'll check A equals B, that is true, and A equals C, that is true. So this will be true, or A equals D, which is false. So it'll be true or false. And because one of those is true, it will give us true. Check that, run this. Indeed, it gives us a true. Clean that up with a new line. Uh, whereas if one of these were changed, then now it'll give us a false. So that's how you can uh, how you can use that. And the way a switch case works is you want to check if a variable equals a set of options. So you want to check if, let's say you're given a character, char character, and this is a. But you want to check if character equals equals a, then you want to just print, then you close it, then you want to do else if character is b, then you want to print b, else if character is C, then you can print C, else if D, D, and so on, right? So if you want to just check if character is A or B or C or whatever, then you can do a bunch of if and else ifs faster way of doing this is with a switch case. So switch, and you give it the variable that you want to check what it equals. So from up above, it's character, right? Because we've got character equals this, check, character equals this, check, character equals this, check. So you're just checking character equals something. So you're switching over the character. And then you do case, and for matching exactly this, we do case of A. So if character is A, then here, then print A. If I want it to be in the case of B, print B. 
in the case of C, print C, and so on. As you can see, this is a bit faster and less typing than doing the if else if. So this is a lot simpler way of doing it. I'll just match the above all the way. B. And finally, with a switch, you do have the option of, and this is if it doesn't match any of the cases, if character does not match any of these cases, then you have a default. And this is what happens. This is what happens if none of the cases above are met. For now, it doesn't. Then we can close switch. Now, when I run this, I'll get it to print A twice. Oops, got some warnings here. Format stream. So I want all of my printfs to be strings, not character. Let's try this again. Any cases? Of course, this is. And an important thing to note here is from this uh, A, A, B, C, D doesn't meet any cases. Uh, with the if, it said characters A, then do A. Otherwise, uh, check if it's B, then do B. Otherwise, check if it's C, then do C. Otherwise, check if it's D, then do D. With switch, it looks at case of A. Then, because it is A, it prints it out. And the way switch works is it then runs all the subsequent stuff, unless you include a break. So it went in and it did a, B, C, D doesn't make, doesn't meet any cases because it printed out this and then immediately did all the other cases and it doesn't check that it matches the case. Um, it just runs and does all the remaining stuff. And often that's not what you want to do. So you have to include a break to make it not do this. But right before that, let's see. If I do this, but I switch this to C, then we should see that the if will only print out a C, and C will print out C, D doesn't meet any cases. So let's check that. And indeed, the if is only printing out C, and then we do C, D doesn't meet any cases. So once it got to the C, it then just ran all the subsequent stuff. So as I started with, the way you fix this is you include a break, and a break just stops it from running right there. So in each case, you can include a break, and that just means that once you've gotten in here, gotten to the break, then it immediately ends your switch. So you won't go in, you won't do the default, and you'll just just do uh, whichever one here. You don't need a break in the default because the default is the last one, so there's no need to break out of anything. It's already going to be finished when you're done with default. So now with switch, if I run this, it should just print out C, C, and not D doesn't meet any cases. So let's check. Indeed, that's what it does. So that's an important note with switches, but it does make it a faster process than just going if character equals equals A, else if character equals equals B, so on. You just do case B, then whatever you want to do. And just remember to include your break if you don't want it to run all the stuff afterwards, um, even whether or not the case is. So that's that we could see if i include an e here we could go through and it'll meet none of these conditions so if i include an else it would do what the else wanted 
So I'll go ahead and do that. And let's say for else, it's just other. Now when I run this, it'll say other from the else there. And then it'll say it doesn't meet any cases because of the default right here. So that's that. And as I said, you can you can write any code in here. You do a computation, C plus C plus one or C plus plus. Um, you could do anything like that. Any number of lines within that case. So that's switch case. That's conditionals uh, dealing with booleans and doing certain things in the case that something is is true. So based upon different uh, options, make certain things happen. So now with this break, this break is also used in something called loops. And we'll look at those loops in just a moment because they're the next big thing. Basically, the way loops are gonna work is where we have this if, if instead of a single check, if we wanted to be able to do something multiple times and we just wanted to check each time that something is true and then keep going, uh, circling back if it is true, then we can do that with loops. So now with loops, we have a couple of different options with loops. We have for, we have while, and we have do while. And each of these are meant to check some condition. And so let's say in a basic program, you start, then you go down, do calculations, and then you want to check, you have an option here, you want to check if something's true, if a is less than one, for example, then you want to go back and you want to do the calculation again. And you want to keep doing this while a is less than one. Then the way you can do this is with a loop, right? It's called a loop because it just circles back and it uh, performs cyclical operations. So with this, we want to pick one of these options. And the way you can structure a for loop, you'll be able to tell from the structure sort of which one you want, and we'll talk about that more later. But the structure of a for loop is for, and then you define a variable. So typically you'll do int n equals zero. This just initializes your variable because with a for loop, you just go through and when you first reach the for loop, you'll start at int n equals zero, and then you will check some condition, let's say n is less than 10. If this is true, then you do go into the for loop. If this is not true, then you go to the closing curly brace here and immediately continue the code. So just like here, you continue down. But if it is true, then you go down this root and do whatever calculations. Uh, and then finally in here, we have what happens when you circle back around, because obviously if we just say int n equals zero and n is less than 10, then if we don't do anything, this is just gonna circle around forever, right? But with for loop, we can then say we want n to have one added to it each time. So n plus plus or n equals n plus one. And again, this just goes into the for loop. It starts out, defines this variable into n equals zero. So if I were to break down what this is actually doing, it's first when it goes into the for loop, it's saying int n equals zero. Then it's saying if n is less than n. 
then it does calculations. And then it says n equals m plus 1. So all that this for loop is doing is it initializes it, checks some condition, runs it if the condition is met, and then performs this operation changing it. And then it loops back to here. And so it'll say n equals n plus 1, n is 1 now. And then it says if n, which is now 1, is less than 10, then do the operation again. So if we write down all that this is doing, it's going to go int n equals 0. If n is less than n, and run that, then n equals n plus 1, 1 now. Then you're circling back and you're saying if n is less than 10, well, 1 is less than 10, then you do that. Then you say n equals n plus 1. Now this is 2, and you say if n is less than 10, well, 2 is less than 10, so it runs this, and then n equals n plus 1, this is 3 now, and if n is less than 10, 3 is less than 10, so it runs it, and so on, you get the idea. And it'll keep going until n is 10, because that'll be the first time when it's not less than 10. And then it'll say if n is less than 10 and n is not less than 10. So it won't do anything here. It'll close it and it'll be done with the loop. So it'll continue right there. So that's the breakdown of how you can use a for loop. You just define some initial variable then you give it some condition to check, and then you give it the iteration. So this happens first, this happens second, then the calculations happen third, then this happens fourth, and then it'll go fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and so on, right? until the conditions no longer met. So that's a for loop. Now there's while loop as well. And the way a while loop will work, it's down a little bit. Pretty similar, but it's a little more simple. You just say while, and you can say some condition. So the same thing that you had in here, and is less than 10, so we could match this example, n is less than 10, then the curly braces, and again, some calculations. And so it's got much less going on here. It's only checking this, and it's not initializing anything, it's not iterating anything, it's just checking the condition. So with the while, it's much, much simpler, it's just basically the exact same as an if statement. Uh, if n is less than 10, then do the calculations. And then it just goes, okay, well, let's say n is less than 10, then it'll go again. If n is less than 10, do some calculations again. Was that true? Let's say yes. Then we keep going. If n it's less than 10, then keep going, and so on. You get the idea. So that's a while loop, and of course, because we don't have a iterator here, we're gonna have to change, if we don't want this to run forever, then if it weren't true at the beginning, then if n was less than 10 at the beginning, we're gonna have to do something in here like n equals n plus 1, or n plus plus, that will uh, basically handle this, but it's built in to the while loop. So for loops and while loops are basically the same thing. It's just with a while loop, you have to initialize this 
into n equals zero, n plus plus. And so this would do exactly the same thing as the for loop. If we add in this bit and this bit, because that'll be that and that. So that's a while loop. Now a do while loop. So both of these works like an if, right? They with for you initialize it, uh, with while you do just whatever's ahead of it, then you go in and check the condition. But both of them check the condition before they do whatever's in here. Uh, do while does the opposite. So the way a do while works is you say do, open curly braces, and then here are your calculations. Then we've got while down here, as you might suspect by the do while, the order is first do and then while. And then here you have your condition. So let's say our condition is again, n is less than 10. And use your semicolon to close it. What happens here is you will first do whatever's in here, then you will check the operation. So it's very similar to the while, but it will right off the bat do whatever's in here. And then it will check if n is less than 10 and so on. So it does the exact same thing as this. Right off the bat, we also do the calculation before anything. So you could create a do while by just writing all your calculations out before a while, just as you can create a for with a while by including the int n equals zero or whatever your initializer is, and then your iterating value. So that's how all these work. Let's walk through an example of applying a for loop. Here we go. Let's say we want to run through an array. So we have an integer array. And it's one, two, three. Now let's say we want to add one to each of these without having to say a at zero is plus one, a at one is a of one plus one, a of two is a of two plus one. And of course, if we had a lot more, this would take a lot longer. To do something like this, we can say len is three. Then we can say four and int n equals zero, then n is less than len and n plus plus. Then we do a, because that's the, our, our index, we're starting at zero, adding one to it each time and uh, putting the condition that it only goes if n is less than len because it starts at zero, we want it to be less than rather than less than equal to. So a at n equals a at n plus one. So then we can end it. And this will do the same thing as this and just go through and obviously now if you had four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, Let's say you went all the way to 100. This, you could just change this to 100. And this is now infinitely faster than trying to write out all these lines. Because you can, of course, write out this from 0 to 99. But why would you do that when you could do this? So that's an example of applying a for loop. All right, so in C, 
four or four loop. We had four, and then we add the initialization, the int n equals zero, or starting whatever variable we're going to iterate through. Then we have condition. Then we have the iteration. So changing the value of n. And then, of course, got whatever. So in my int main, I can say four. Let's say we do want to just go through an array and add one to each of the elements. So I'll make int my array. And let's say we want an array of length. So the array, length of the array is 15. And we want 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Now I've got my array and I want to say four. I want to initialize it and have it. Let's say I want counter to be my variable that I initialize. I want to start it at zero. Or let's start it at one in this case. So I'm starting a variable called counter at one. Then I want my condition to check. And if I start my counter at one, then I want the counter, and this will just be where I am in the array, to be less than or equal to 15. So I want to go up to the last point in my array and update its value. So counter is less than or equal to 15, and I want counter to add 1 to it each time I go through this. So I'll just create a new array. And this would be my array two of length. Just initialize it. Then I'll make my array two to be five plus my array, let's say. Then I could do my array two at counter. And because I start at zero, I want to do counter minus one equals my array at counter minus one plus five. So I'm just going through and counter is the position I'm at. But because it starts at zero, uh, I want to do counter minus one in this case, for the position in the array, the index. And then my array two at that index is my array at that index plus five. So I just go through each of the positions in that array and make sure we're good. So if I run this, error len is undeclared, of course. I need to do int len. Variable size object may not be initialized. The reason for this, let's fix it. It's because I fed in a variable instead of a just typing in the number into this array. So you can just swap this to 15. So when we do this, we can check. So to do this, let's go. We have printing a double. Let's just make a quick function and integer and a. Then we want to print percent d new line and a so print i and then i'll print off the old value my array then i'll print off the new value my array two and then i'll just print space and enter there to make it clearer and actually let's also print out counter minus one is so we know where we're going and let's just do counter so it's starting at one basically print percent d In my function i did print instead of printf so it's that 
Now when we run it, we can scroll up. We get 116. So one is the position. Uh, that's the counter. Then the old, then the new. So she get 116. Then we go to two. The second value is two. Add five to two. That's seven. Perfect. Uh, then we get to the third. Third is three. Add five to three. That's eight. And so on. As soon as we get to 15, the value at 15 is 15. And 15 plus five is 20. So then, of course, I could call these up after the loop. And if I wanted to just see, let's say, print. I want just my array two at third, which will be the fourth in it. Oops, that didn't work because I didn't have semicolon. Now I get a nine in the third position which the original in the third position, zero, one, two, three, would be four, add five to that, and we get nine. So that for loop is working great. Now let's just add a comment here so it doesn't print out all this stuff when I move on. Okay, now it's blank. So. Now into while loops. So with while, a bit simpler, instead of the init, the condition, and the iteration, we can just do while and condition. Then whatever we do, and close it. Okay, so let's do something with that in here. Let's say we are given some starting point. Start is 15. So let's just say we're trying to solve a problem. We start at the mile marker 15 and we want to go through um, each until we get to the 20th. So while uh, position is less than end and let's say position starts out at start then at the end saying we want to stop at 20 we want the position to be less than the end and let's say each time we go through this we want to get another step forward and let's say each step we go an additional point three so in order to do that, we'll want to make sure we're paying attention to the data types, first of all, and we'll want doubles instead of integers because my integer wouldn't be able to add 0.3. So let's say step amount is 0.3, another double. Then while position is less than end, let's do Step count is zero. So we have an integer that just counts how many steps we've taken to this point past the 15. Then we can say while position is less than end, we want position to be position plus the step amount. And we want step count to be step count plus one. So each time we go through this loop, we say we want the position to be moved the step amount forward and uh, count that we've taken another step. Then we can print out the step count to see what that is. Uh, how many point three increment steps we have have to take in order to get to the end of 20. So this makes it really easy because we could just change, like if our step amount was 0 0.01 instead, we just change that real quick and we can see how many steps that will take. So if we run this, it'll take 500 steps if the step is 0 0.01. If it's 0 0.03, 167. So it makes it very easy for us to to do that. If 
if we already knew that it had taken a thousand steps to get to mile marker 15, then to get to mile marker 20, we want the total number of steps, including the steps to get to the 15. Then we could just make the step count start at 1000 or whatever that initial count was at 15 and then continue on. And this worked just fine with that. So that makes it really easy. That's an example where you may want to use while. Now let's comment this out. And with a do while, it works just like while, right? Except it always runs the first one, even if the condition isn't met. So I just do do. Let's see, what would be an example where I want to use do while? Let's say I am controlling a robot and I want it to move forward. And then I want it to do something based upon it moving forward. Well, I want to start off by moving it forward. Uh, position is zero. Then I could say position plus plus. And then let's say I want to do it while well, my position is less than 1000. That's how I can do that, right? And now in either case, it will do the moving forward, uh, whether or not the while condition is met. In this case, position is less than 1000. So maybe or maybe not you want to do this, but uh, that's how you can do it if if you want the first uh, computations to be actually done always. So then I can print my position now. So I'm just changing the position from up here. So instead I'll do POS short for position. Then I can swap these to POS. And finally this. And now we're good because you have to be careful to not be using the same variable when I when I don't want to override it. So now it takes a thousand, it starts at zero, does the first one, and then it keeps going while it's less than a thousand. And it, it got to the thousand because it did this, added it, and then it checked. There we go. That's loops. And when we were talking about uh, switch case before, we were talking about break. Um, the way a break works is it kicks you out of a loop. So let's say in this for loop, we want it to go until the counter is less than or equal to 15, but we want some other condition to be checked. Let's say if counter times three is less than 11. If this condition is met, the way we can break out of here is we do a break and this will just break out of this for loop right here. So you just have whatever condition you wanna be met here. If, if that's true, it will go in and whenever you hit a break, it immediately breaks it out of the uh, loop or switch case that you're within. So it doesn't have anything to do with breaking out of this if, it just has to do with breaking out of this for. So if you get in here, you'll immediately stop the loop and get right to this point. There's also continue. What a continue does is it's much like a break but continue will, instead of kicking you out of loop entirely, continue will just make sure that you don't run anything past it in the loop. And then it'll go straight to this point, basically, and circle back and do the next iteration of the loop. So it won't break you out of the loop. It'll just say, continue on, start the next iteration of this loop. So, and you can do a break and a continue in a while and a do while just the same. All right, and if we take a look at this, we'll see with this set of for loops, so we have a for loop and then inside that for loop, we got a for loop. 
And inside there, we have some calculations and an if statement. With this, uh, inside the if, we have a break. And what will happen with that break, as you can see, is when we hit that break, we immediately hit outside of this inside for loop. So we'll hit that uh, first curly brace, go past it, second curly brace, and that's the inside for loop closed. So we'll just hit that point and then continue on. And continuing on from there means hitting the uh, closed curly brace for the outside for loop. Once we hit that, we'll just continue on with the code like normal because the break is just breaking us out of this first loop. So it'll continue on. It will just finish that for loop as if it's completed, uh, then immediately kick it out and continue on with the outside for loop as normal. So if we wanted to have the outside for loop closed as well, we have to have a break that is not inside the inside for loop, but is in the outside for loop. And here's a flowchart diagram of sort of that process of just if you break from inside the internal loop, you just circle back, go to the next iteration of the external loop. And you would run any code after the internal loop inside the external for loop. And hopefully you learned something. Thanks for watching.